Hello and welcome to this TechSoup hosted webinar. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. We're going to be talking about maximizing impact. That's very important. You want to maximize your impact, right? So we're talking about website, nonprofit website planning, budgeting, and design. I'm going to give you the housekeeping rules. Somebody's already turned on the closed caption. If you need the closed caption, just type on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. This is being recorded. You're going to get the video replay. You're going to get the slides probably by tomorrow. I'm going to make sure they go to your inbox and so make sure you click on that YouTube page and hit a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. And if you learned something cool today, go ahead and share it with us here and hashtag TechSoup on all your social media platforms. So I'm going to give you one more announcement and then I'm going to move out the way. If you have not heard of Quad, I'm going to put a link of Quad in the, about Quad in the chat room. Quad is a peer-to-peer -peer community we hear at TechSoup. If you're a member of Quad, put a one in the chat. I always like to know who's a member of Quad, but we have exclusive events just for Quad members. Again, I'm going to put a link in the chat so you can learn more about Quad on your own. And also when you get this slide, you can click on the hyperlink. But I'm going to turn it over to the founders of TAP Network. We have the founders of TAP Network. How often do you have the founders here doing a webinar? Over to you, Kyle and Joe. Have a great webinar, guys. Great. Thanks, Aretha. Hi, I'm Joe DiGiovanni. I'm one of the co-founders of TAP Network. And with me is uh, Kyle Barkins. Good morning. Good afternoon. We're, we're excited to be here. Um, today, we're going to talk about maximizing your website and really get into detail on not just that, because to maximize your website, you're, you're going to need budget. And we'll go through the different uh, ways that we budget. And we work with a lot of nonprofits, the best way to budget for your website taking a growth-driven design approach. We'll go through in detail on that. And then we'll look at some of TechSoup's website offerings to see if there's an opportunity to support uh, to support your website development efforts. Great, so just a quick quick background. With, with TAP Network, we work with a lot of global purpose-driven organizations. Um, we work with Toyota, Denso, a lot of uh, clients from an international standpoint. And what we like to do is, is take our learnings, whether it's learning management systems, web portals, and, and port that over to the nonprofit space. So we're TechSoup's exclusive provider for nonprofit website services and, and digital marketing. So we've launched over 3,000 websites um, in the nonprofit space. I want to bring, bring some of our expertise and learnings to you and answer questions because we're all learning uh, together, especially with AI and a lot of new uh, tools and technologies that are coming into the space. So we'll quickly get started. So today, um, you know, we'll talk about website development, but website development also involves a lot of different um, initiatives as well. That's strategy, creative branding, e-commerce. So we'll talk about some of these things, but through TechSoup, we offer this full suite of services. So as you're developing your website, and want to bring it to life, integrate marketing, and then really drive impact, whether it's fundraising or um, or you know engaging your community, making an impact, measuring that impact, all these pieces uh, will 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 come together. But we'll today we'll go into website development and a few more of these. First thing we want to do is is start off with a poll. You know, what is the biggest challenge your nonprofit faces when it comes to website? planning, budgeting, and design. And you could just put it in the chat. Um, you know, is it a limited budget for, for your website development? Is it uncertainty about aligning your website goals and your mission? Is it difficulty in creating engaging, impactful website content? AI is making that a bit easier, but there's challenges there. Um, and then challenges in ensuring website accessibility and user experience. All the above, A and C. We're flying blind, yep. Finding a full stack developer, that's key. Yeah, so it seems like, I mean, everyone's having a challenge with, with budget, content, um, engaging content, content that'll rise above the clutter, um, uncertainty with, with website goals and nonprofit missions. So we'll address those today. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll get you on the right foot. So in terms of the next slide, uh, strategic planning. So let's start there. You know, with a lot of our clients, when we talk about strategic planning, 
we, we take a marketing approach per se when it comes to websites. So if, if, if you know what your website is going to do in terms of engaging your client. So if you're looking at a marketing plan, you, know, you take a full funnel approach. At the top of the funnel, it's awareness, and then you have consideration, engagement, and then promoter. In case of your website, you want a, people to come to that website and right off the bat in your header, you want them to know what you do, why you do it, and, and the purpose. And then with content, you know, that was the question number C is that's the middle part of the funnel. That's consideration. That's where your educational content comes in. And then engagement, that's where that full stack developer comes in, the CRM. How are you engaging your clients on your website? And then activating them, you know, integrating social media, integrating email, all those other pieces. So when folks come to your website, in some cases, you could do all this on your landing page, right on your homepage. But in most cases, it's going to be the different parts of your website working together. So we'll go through all that today. So step one is aligning uh, your website goals with your nonprofit mission. Um, you know, this comes down to being able to explain your core values, the objectives and activities of your nonprofit on your website, but also being able to put the tools in place to actually achieve those objectives, and then to have the content that really drives that messaging home, and then aligning the website goals with, with your brand identity. So step one is, what is what is your nonprofit's goals? What is your website's goals, and, and, and how do they align? And most cases, they, they align you know, almost 100%, your website really being the, the engine that drives your mission and, and your fundraising. For step two, it's identifying your your key target audiences, and what's what's super challenging about being a nonprofit. You know, we've worked in in the public space as well, and in public space, you have B two C companies who just they market to consumers. B two B, they market to businesses, um, and you have B two G. You know, they're 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 engaging government. So for nonprofits, the challenge that a lot of you face is you're doing all three. You're trying to serve your community and you're targeting co consumers, but you're also trying to raise donations and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising from consumers. The B2B aspect is engaging stakeholders and partners and corporate funders. And then B2G is, is the grants and, and working with, you know, within the community and policy. So, you know, identifying those audiences, breaking them down, and then ultimately mapping out you know, the messaging that you want to have for them. But it's super critical to to do that. And as, you know, like I said, nonprofits, it's it's more challenging than I, and I think in businesses to to really do that. So that would be step number two is take a look at all those different stakeholders and, and audiences. And then step three is defining the objectives, the key performance indicators. So if it's stakeholders, you know, how many corporate funders are you looking to engage? Are you or is it just trying to get, you know, meetings? It's going to be Difficult to nearly impossible to have a corporate fund that come in and say, here, here's here's ten thousand dollars. You're really using the website to educate them, gain a meeting, and 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 do those face to face uh, pieces of, of all that. But on the consumer standpoint, if if you're trying to address the community, let's say you're a, a diabetes association, you're you're addressing diabetics, nutrition, and exercise. You want to get that right content out there, and that that traffic could be people committing to to that or seeing their doctor or or educate or or just becoming educated and reading certain materials. So each each audience is going to have different objectives. Some are going to be fiscal, some are going to be more behavior change and looking at those and mapping and for step four, next slide is uh Putting together, taking a look at your existing content, what we'll generally do is, you know, once you know who your audiences are, taking a look at your content, doing a content audience and, and seeing where those gaps are. So for funders, what content do you have? What content do you want to keep, replace, or, or edit? And we'll map all that out. You can do it in Excel. We'll use Airtable. But really doing a content audit and, and looking at the, the member journey and seeing how those align. In a lot of cases, you'll see that the content needs to be refreshed or cleaned up, or just the way from a UI UX standpoint, 
that folks are getting to that content, that there might be some roadblocks there. So that's step four. And here's just an example of a user journey mapping. This is a nonprofit that recruits um, healthcare providers. So when you're looking at your nonprofit, you're not just driving people to the website because you're gonna have multiple audiences. You're gonna have specific landing pages for each audience. So mapping out that user journey. Um, at the top, you know, that's the funnel going left to right, awareness, consideration, engage and capture. You're getting their email addresses. In this case, they're filling out an application to um, apply for a job. It could be the app, instead of application, that could be, you know, they're making a donation or they're volunteering. But mapping out that journey is, is critical. And that's a really great way to really set up kind of, you know, the strategic portion of, of what you're doing and then taking a look at the budgeting to, to do all this. And Kyle will dig in uh, into all that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, we, we wanted to cover the the initial, um, you know, kind of planning for success because, you know, we understand that there's a certain budget um, and I'll just jump right into this poll question. I'll leave it up there. Um, so what is your biggest challenge when it comes to budgeting for your nonprofit's website? If you just throw those in the chat. So is it determining the appropriate allocation of funds? Is it finding cost-effective solutions without sacrificing quality? So do you do it yourself or outsource it basically? Um, is it making sure that you have the correct budgetary resources and or is it maximizing ROI with those funds? And of course it can be all of them or you know a mix of those. Uh, interested to see what you all say in the chat, um, but I'll come back to that, to my earlier point. Uh, you know, have, before you jump in and say, hey, we, you know, we, we, we need to build, build this website, it's kind of good, it's better to answer the why and what you want to improve. So to Joe's point, you know, what are those, those objectives? What are, what are the key results you're looking to, to achieve? You know, what, what content exists? How, how big is that lift going to be? You know, as Joe mentioned, we've done a couple thousand websites. We've did some of our, some in our past life, some as part, more of those as part of TAP, especially for nonprofits. And one of the biggest challenges we often face is that content phase because there's either a lot there and they don't know how, and, and the the organizations don't know how to disseminate that uh, efficiently and effectively to the, to their, to their audience, or they think there's a lot, or they think they, they think they have enough. And once it comes time to start building that website, um, they start to realize, you know, oh, we don't, you know, this isn't put together sufficiently, or we don't, you know, there's some gaps here. And then that, that will often delay the project. So it looks like a, a lot of a lot of people are saying A through D or are all of the above, uh, and that's that's kind of common. That's what we see pretty frequently. Um, typically, the ones that that's, that stand out that that people identify would be you know having a finding the cost effective solution, deciding if they're going to do this themselves, try to take this on their own, uh, if they're going to pay someone else to do it, and then you know what what that that budget looks like. So we hope we can answer some of those questions today, uh, or, or follow up uh, with a follow up conversation. So just some some factors that we often see that influence uh, that website budget, where it's going to, you know, that that price price is going to creep up, uh, or where you're going to see, you know, an, an increased cost uh, over time. One would just be thinking of like the complexity of the features. So think of this as like not biting off more than you can chew as an organization, as well as like what's mission critical. And we'll talk about all, you know our growth driven design, our launch pad style development, where we we hope to eliminate a lot of this. Um, you know, these types of concerns as we go. Um, customization requirements. So, you know, trying to get hyper-specific uh, on your website or it needs to do something exactly this way. Uh, and, and and sometimes often forgetting that the end user is the one that you, you should be appealing to, not just a, a personal preference. Um, selecting the right platform. So platform can have platforms can have a cost. The cost of building on a platform can have an, an enhanced cost as well. So even though it might be, Let's just say you know you get you get Wix for free or something like that. But if the platform doesn't you know fit your needs, there's going to be a cost to either customize it or, or eventually to move off of that. Uh, and then think of external services, things you're currently using, things that you're planning to use. Uh, do they integrate with that website? So to Joe's that buyer that user journey mapping, you know, is, is your website going to work with your forms and your your email marketing or any of your automation or any of your social media platforms? And then all the while thinking about this uh, from the terms of scalability and future growth needs. So I, I'm sure there, there are plenty of organizations on here that are happy with where they are. And they, they uh, maybe it's like sort of like a part-time role for you or, or part-time type of organization where you're trying to spread some awareness about a specific cause. And it doesn't really need to grow much over time. 
but there are also many that that you know have these initiatives where they need to grow revenue, grow donations, grow funding year over year, grow impact year over year. So just like your organization, your website needs to be scalable uh, and built for that future growth as well. When you're determining how you're going to budget, we, we like to create a prior, prioritization um, sort of matrix or, or outline here. So you start with that needs assessment, which we which Joe touched on originally, uh, and align your goals with, with uh, this investment. And then look at um, you know evaluating what that impact is going to be. So what's the potential ROI uh, of these investments? How quickly are you going to see a return from these things? So if it's like increasing donations uh, or increasing event attendance or registration, you know, what does that, what does that impact look like? Um, think about how this is going to um, optimize your resources. So a lot of times, yes, the, the cost of the website might be a little bit more, but if that gets you, gets you a few hours a week or a few hours a month back because your website's able to, to work, work better for you or even work is almost like replace uh, someone in, in a specific role so that they can spend their time doing something else like, you know, driving more donations or doing uh, more outreach. It, are you able to optimize those resources with this new website? What does that What does that look like from a cost or a cost benefit uh, analysis for you? Uh, and then just think about the flexibility and adaptability of uh, whatever this, you know, whatever you're investing in. You know, how, how can it grow with you? As we mentioned, how can they, how can you add pieces on to the future? How can you be sure that you're not capped at, at what you've put out there now? So you're gonna have to come back and do the same thing over again in a year or so. When it comes to down to allocating the budget, um, we sort of break this down into, you know, where where this money goes. So there's, we we break it down sort of like development, maintenance, uh, and then like marketing after this is this this is launched. So the first phase is that initial design, um, the functionality. So if you've done the back the background work and identified like what content needs to be ported over, and you have an understanding of what, um, what your your customers or your potential customers or supporters should be doing on the website and what purpose your website serves, then it's figuring out what that, what that design is going to look like coming up with multiple designs, possibly for different pages, um, building out the functionality. So that that's the first piece, you know, what, how much are you allocating for that? Um, and then what's, what is the ongoing maintenance looks like? So you might not spend a bunch up front, but if you get a ton of visitors and there's a lot of complexities in the website, or you've picked a platform that has a substantial, you know, ongoing cost. What does that that look like from a maintenance, hosting, security, upkeep um, standpoint? And that can be that could be platform costs. It can also be personnel costs. So if you're not, you know, if you're frequently going to be making updates to your website, um, you know, ensuring that that doesn't become cost prohibitive, having to pay someone, whether that's on staff or external, and, and understanding what that that cost looks like. And then obviously, you know, if you spend all this 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 time, resources, and money. On launching the website, you want to make sure it gets out there. You want to make sure people see it. So, being sure to plan for and allocate some budget for, uh, you know, a launch um, that's going to promote this website. That you know, whether that's just something more organic, and you're creating uh, posts through social media, or if you're going to do a larger, P, you know, sort of PR push. Um, you know, there's all there's actual costs, and then there's the you know the internal costs or the the marketing um, or like the agency costs that come along with that. So jumping into our next poll, thinking about what we just talked about, how much have you, we want to know how much you've all have budgeted for, you know, your web and digital marketing. Um, we're really thinking about over the course of a year, but this can be just project-based um, as well. So A is we haven't, B, less than $5,000, uh, C, between five to 25,000, and D is, is more than 25,000. So something a little bit more cost of a full-time employee or more. Seems like a good mix coming through. People saying, uh, you know, we haven't. Um, and then looks like a lot under 25,000, but some over the $5,000 range. Cool. It's good to see a good mix there um, and, and really not, not unexpected. Um, I think, you know, we expect to see... Um, you know, kind of that 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 mix there, and but we we also want to make sure that not having the budget doesn't isn't going to preclude you from you know having putting your best a good foot forward and having a website. You know, taking that first step to make sure that you've you know you've got like a, a presentable, um, usable kind of cross platform site available for your organization, and 
as I said earlier, not, not biting off more than you can chew. So not trying to do everything all at once and, and outlining, um, you know, what's sort of mission critical for your organization if you don't have the budget at this point to get there or don't have the resources at this point to get there. So some ways to maximize that um, would be just setting measurable goals for you up front. So understand what your, your objectives are. You know, if you're a small one or two person organization with a limited budget and you say you want to raise a million dollars this year online, that's probably a pipe dream. Like, so we, we want to make sure that we set something that's realistic and measurable. So, so look at like what your, what's your size, of your market looks like and what's really attainable for you and how you can, how you can get that through your website. Make sure if once you do that, that you're able to track and analyze the performance of your site. That could be your current site to see how you're performing now. So you can set those goals. That could also be, um, you know, this future site so that you're able to track against that. Um, always be optimizing. So you, you'll hear us talk about this a lot more and more if you talk to us following this webinar, but always look for you know the opportunity to optimize and update. So measure what's there, see what's working, see what's not working and be able to make, um, be able to pivot as necessary. So whether that's like reducing the number of clicks it takes to get to a donation form um, or taking some of that friction out for someone who's navigating your site or getting to your site. Um, to that point, uh, you know, like the number of clicks it takes or the, the friction in navigation, make sure that you're investing, whether it's time, resources or money uh, in the user experience and keeping that updated. User experience can cover everything from just how easy it is for someone to use the website or how accessible your website is. So the people who might be visually imp impaired or might not have access to fast to, to a, a high speed Internet connection or might be on a mobile device, be sure that they can all um, get what's what's needed out of your website. And it's not alienating someone when they're when they're visiting your website uh, and then ultimately kind of going back to those those goals and, and analyzing performance use those insights to to to, to guide you forward so look at this as a, as a constantly iterative process over time so I can, with that in mind we can start we can jump into um impactful design your website. So that user experience and what makes a great nonprofit website. So we talked about scalability and flexibility. We'll touch more on user experience and then also integration opportunities. So how do you bring things besides just the core website itself in um, to be part of your entire marketing mix? One of the first things you're going to want to pick uh, and, and one of the, the where, where that price is going to depend uh, on, you know, an actual cost for a platform or the cost to, to, to develop on the platform is the content management system. So this is where, you know, you're putting the content in where your, your templates live on top of this, where the design lives and it makes it, uh, it hopefully user-friendly and easy for you, someone in your organization or an agency or someone you partner with to make updates to the content, to be sure that, you know, when something changes, it doesn't completely change uh, the entire look and feel of the website and all kind of feels cohesive. Uh, across the board and is something that you can scale uh, and, and on top of. So on this screen, these are just a few examples on the left, on the left side, on my left side of the screen, um, you'll see like Wix and Squarespace. So these are managed content management systems. These can be, there's of course, you know, nonprofit discounts available, but these are, um, you know, hosted by the, the companies there. So it's all kind of packed, so, so packaged up, so to speak. A lot, of, a lot of flexibility with these, but it's not sort of unlimited flexibility. So you can't do as much development on or into those as you could uh, with other platforms like the open source ones on this screen, WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla. Again, there's others out there. These are just sort of like the, the industry standards. Um, and, you know, we've kind of highlighted the one that we work on most frequently being WordPress um, as there's such a large uh, development uh, team, so to speak, out there with 40 million or so people using WordPress with more than half or more than a quarter of all websites on the internet in 2023 um, being built on, on WordPress and some of the biggest organizations um, you'll see what you know, have chosen WordPress as their, their platform of choice. Nice thing about that is there's no actual cost to WordPress. It's just the cost for the resources to develop onto it. And then if you have any like uh, paid plugins or things like that, that integrate with it. Once you select the platform, uh, you know, and you've done your kind of con content audit, it's important to to outline what that site architecture is going to look like. So that's this is generally thinking of like how someone's going to navigate your site, but this is that hierarchy um, of of how someone's how that content's going to be laid out. So this you might often hear this called information architecture. Uh, you might hear it be you know called site architecture. 
Uh, one thing we like to do that makes this a little bit easier is like being able to take, you know, every page that you're going to have on your website, write them out onto index cards, put them on a table and figure out where, or, you know, on a, on a wall, if you got post-it notes and figure out, you know, how things are, how things lay out hierarchically. So, you know, the homepage is going to be the top level, maybe about us, as we see on the screen here, is going to be the top level and what we do. And then the things that, that show up underneath that and, and try to make this as concise, uh, and organized as possible. And then once you have that, see, uh, you know, start, then you can start to get further down that funnel and outline how, um, you know, what audience is going to be going to go to those web, go to those pages, what their, their user flow is going to look like. Then we want to think about, as I talk about, so not just mobile optimization, but this is really user experience. So being sure that, you know, if someone visits your website from a mobile device, maybe they're on a slower connection. It's obviously typically going to be a smaller screen, but they're still able to engage and, and, and get the most out of, out of your website and from your organization. So think about, you know, keep reducing the size of images and, and assets on the site so that the site can load quickly. Also selecting a host so that, uh, you know, a good host that, that can deliver that, that site quickly. Um, be sure the sizing changes for the screen. So you'll often go to a website, you'll see you have to like pinch or zoom um, or something like that because it's not really optimized for mobile. It's not responsive. Uh, ensure that the layout is, is optimized for mobile too. So, you know, if you have a bunch of things scrunched next to each other, it makes it harder to see, harder to read. Uh, that's probably not the optimal experience for a user or on a mobile device. Uh, ensure that, that, you know, you can see the activity you can, and someone can see what's what's meant to be a button, what's meant to be a link, what's meant to be um, a, a point of engagement on the site and give them a way to engage. So, you know, look at like having forms, having, uh, you know, a, a natural progression of how someone's going to navigate through your site just as they would on a desktop. Uh, but this is more important, more and more important every day as people are choosing their 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 mobile devices where they, they get their email, they're conducting business from their mobile device. It's kind of always, you know, in their hand or in their pocket. So it's a great way to be able to reach them with your marketing efforts and be sure that you're driving them to that, that, you know, new or updated uh, web assets you've created. And just an example here of what, you know, mobile optimization looks like uh, on the left, you see uh, what, what this looks like, what their website would look like on a, on a desktop in the middle, you'd see sort of what the, the kind of common mobile optimization would look like. But then on the right side, you see what the ideal optimized page looks like. So it's, it's not just a, a scaled down version of the website. It's actually, you see the contact us and the donate now uh, are right there so that the user can engage. And you see that there's some of their content showing above the fold. So it gives you the, the user, the, the, the concept of being able to scroll down and see, see more. And that, that image, that picture, um, just as it is on the desktop is, is available. So there's some, some imagery or something that, that kind of jumps out at you when you, when you first reach that page. And then just, Kind of lastly, but certainly not the most, least important, is thinking about what else is going to integrate into your website and how can you automate, um, you know, things within the website or within your web, uh, within your web presence. So that would be stuff like your CRM, so your constituent relationship management, or if you want to co call it contact relationship management. Those platforms make sure that that you know if somebody fills out a website, a, a form on your website, that's going to at least talk to that CRM or at least be able to push some of that information in, so you can see who's done what, when, um, things of that nature. Uh, marketing automation tools. So think things like Active Campaign or HubSpot or MailChimp. Being sure that you know when someone takes an action on your website, you can follow up and engage with them um, so that you can take some of the manual effort, manual work out of that. This is really important, especially for donation donors and fundraisers. So being sure if someone does donate, you're thanking them kind of quickly, and it's it's a personalized message. Uh, and then you also have created a mechanism to follow up with them to say, hey, your donation would go a lot further when it's shared. Here's a link to share this with a friend um, or, you know, other kind of common follow-up and automation uh, and then other donation and fundraising tools. So depending on which donor platform or donor management platform um, or fundraising platforms you might use, just some examples of things that you should, that you should be thinking about and planning uh, when you're building or rebuilding a website. I'll turn it over to Joe to, to give us a little bit more background on the growth driven, driven design methodology that we follow at TAP and we, we highly recommend uh, you all start thinking about when you're planning these redesigns. Great, thanks Kyle. Yeah, so launching a, a new website is daunting. Um, it's it's easier to, to attend webinars and talk about it than, than actually go through it. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like doing your taxes, I guess. So co question we have here is, um, when's the last time you updated or redesigned your website? 
Let's see. Yeah, over two to three years yesterday. Congrats. <laughs> um, yeah, so on, on, on average, you know, mo most nonprofits, we did a, a benchmark study last year. Um, it, it's it's around two to three years when, when folks redo their website. And then the big the big challenge is, you know, how much of, of a redevelopment uh, is that? Is it relaunching the entire website? Or is it is it improving elements of it? So uh, today we're going to talk about a growth driven design approach that that we have uh, versus traditional approaches. So if you think of traditional traditional website design, that's generally a very arduous process, takes up to a year, very large budget, and in, in a lot of cases, once it's done, maybe your mission has changed, <laughs> technology has changed. And it might not be as relevant from a you know, tech stack standpoint, as well as kind of really addressing your mission. So things are, are happening now in this new age of acceleration so fast that taking a huge undertaking and building this massive website um, over a course of a year may, may not be the best approach. And that and that's kind of what we've seen, especially for nonprofits on a budget. It's, it's this um, agile approach to, to building websites. So... You know, we kind of want to get away from the high cost, long timelines and limited updates post-launch. So, you know, as you're building this, there's not much you can do and you're stuck with this old website that's not achieving what you want to achieve and your new website is getting delayed. It's taking forever. So the approach that we take um, is a gross driven design versus traditional design. And what that means is having a quick launch website, something that you can launch quickly and then iterate over time with a, a shorter budget, quicker, getting the market quicker. And at the end of the day, you know, along this whole time timeline, your, your website is still efficient and achieving your needs instead of being stuck in this one or two year bog where you might not be uh, achieving your results and stuck with your old website. So what's that look like? Um, here's the big picture. So first we come up with the strategy, kind of like we talked in the beginning of the presentation and we map out what's a launch pad website. What is the, you know, minimum viable product that is going to get you up, but make a big impact. And in this case, in a lot of cases with, with nonprofits, it's really getting your story down, the design, the user experience, mainly the homepage. Um, and that could be done inexpensively. And then, the other bells and whistles that you might want to add down the road, more details on, you know, it could be a resource center or a more integrated donation platform. But in the beginning, it's really getting your messaging and your voice across on your website. And then it's a continuous improvement process. So we launch that Launchpad website and then we develop it. It goes live. We monitor it. We learn. We transfer that knowledge back. And it's a continual process. So it's a smaller investment up front. And then on a monthly or quarterly basis, you're continually uh, evolving your website. So you might learn something new about your funders. And it could be the messaging. It could be the way they donate. It could be the content they're interested in or a resource library. That could be evolving. And if you put all this investment up front on a traditional website and you get that wrong, then it's not going to bode well for you. And likewise, if you're targeting folks in the community that you're serving, whether it's the homeless or food secure insecurity, you know, you want to make sure that the messaging you're getting out, the user experience is on point, and you want to be able to re reiterate that. So from a growth-driven standpoint, it's a constant evolving process, and the investment is is spread out over a much longer time period, but you're continually to to improve. So that's generally the kind of the big picture for growth driven design. Um, you know, there's there's a different strategy here, but it's it's kind of like we talked before. We'll look at the target audience, the website goals. We'll do a content audit and a site structure, but not on this grand level. We'll have ultimately a scope where we want to get to, but on the quick lights, quick launch site, what can we do to to get the to, to get to market quickly? And that's where the Launchpad website comes in. So generally what that will include will be a content management system. It could be, you know, WordPress has one already built in. 
taking a look at the user experience, the design, the initial integrations, which could be you know the about us, what we do, donate, blogs, social media feeds, um, and then maybe a CRM on the back end. So if people are filling out forms, you're gathering that information, porting it over to MailChimp or whatever you may be using. But getting that quick Launchpad website launched with with the basics, but those basics are really powering 80, 90 percent of of what you're trying to do. And then continuous improvement. So in this case, you know, a lot of nonprofits will budget for that continuous improvement. We'll look at, you know, we'll look at where the traffic's coming in, where folks are going, are they donating, are they volunteering, are they engaging in content? You know, what's the bounce rate? And if we could improve each one of these pieces, whether it's, you know, a click through from the homepage to the donation page, or there's a call to action or a form, if we can increase, maybe it's five steps that, that folks need to ultimately make a donation. They, they need to understand what you guys do. They're reading content. They're, they're understanding how they can get involved. And if you can increase the conversion rate five, 10% at these different critical points, then, you know, D doing the math, you could literally double your donations, double your volunteers, double the impact that you're having to your community. And it's being able to do this continuous improvement at each little touch point. Where can you make those iterative um, improvements? And that's really the power of, of growth-driven design. So with that being said, uh, you know, kind of want to put our money where our mouth is. And Kyle will go over some success stories. Uh, like I said, text TAP Network is TechSoup's exclusive provider for website services. So we'll share some of, um, of our TechSoup members who, who are also clients. Thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm just going to breeze through a few of these, just to kind of show some befores and before and afters, um, you know, and how we we made some improvements to these different websites. Um, so the one of the first ones, and you, you'll see the, the one on the left versus the one on the right to showcase the difference uh, in just like look, feel, layout, but but focus on some of the things that um, that Joe mentioned and as we talked about site structure. So this was the Down Syndrome Association of Texas or of Central Texas. Uh, and we started with a sort of more traditional, I think the site was actually on Squarespace, probably used one of like their built-in, their, their pre-built templates, uh, followed a very basic navigation structure without, without a lot of, you know, opportunity to, to more easily navigate the website and you can actually see like that was the, what you see on the left was actually their home page it was just a uh, picture and a bunch of text uh, great for you know screen readers but not so great for like usability and for for user experience uh, we changed that to you know a, a more i think visually appealing website with with some more engagement um, opportunities for engagement and a better way to navigate to kind of show like the different programs that are available right on the forefront of the of their homepage, um, and then what the, how those programs support their community. You can see that at the bottom. So it shows you know the different the different ways you can have an impact. And each one of these has a call to action and a way to to, to navigate to the next step. So we went through that kind of content architecture and that user flow. We identified like what are the different paths the user take and take users take, and how do we make sure we can get them on that path, path as quickly as possible. Um, we do this by, you know, as we mentioned here, like organizing the resource, the, the different resources, um, and content into different buckets by audience, by category and by type of content. So the types could be like downloads, blogs, events, things like that. Um, we, we brought that, those key events and that activity to the homepage. And we also made it so it's searchable, uh, and sortable by like age and date type event type, things like that. Uh, and then you can e easily see how, um, what, what the benefits are of membership and we created a, a really user-friendly uh, application form for them as well if you visit that site as the example uh, another one was the the one pulse academy um, this was a, a program that we launched with them called the triangle program which just helped uh, better identify opportunities for for educational outreach so we created a templated format for their organization. So it made it easy for them to pull in previous programs um, and upload all this. They had a lot of old content, but we made we created a template that made it easy to port that over and then em emphasize user experience there. So if a user went was navigating through multiple different programs, old programs, 
it was easy for them to find out what the program was, what it was about, the some of the key highlights, which is very different from what they had before where each one was sort of added ad hoc and every everyone was different. So no two were the same. It made it harder for users to navigate the site. Um, we made that also sortable, searchable, filterable. So it's easy for the, for people to come to the website and find the different programs that are that they're interested in. They might they may be interested in that would resonate with them. Um, this was really was grant specific. So they were grant funded for this this program. So we had to kind of mesh the the grant requirements as well as you know our methodology and our process of a, that growth driven uh, methodology as well. And this really helps encourage like that future engagement, the ability to add events in the future and add programs in the future, so they could easily quickly scale from this um, it, without having to go back and redesign the site or or add a bunch of new functionality to it. And then a, a final uh, one of the final examples that we'll share today. Is was a company called Green or a, an organization called Green Lake Preschool. Again, you can see the comparison between the existing site and the new site, uh, left versus right. So again, just a really templated site with a bunch of content on it, um, but no really great way to navigate the site. No, we weren't. They weren't highlighting any of their mission, vision, values. You know, there wasn't a lot of a, a what is this organization? What do they do? And it really did. We really didn't think it. Um, it showcased like the the benefits, the the power, the impact that organization has, especially through, um, you know, the children, the, the lives that they affect. So we, we re redesigned that site. We uh, reoriented their content. We consolidated. They had a lot of content. We consolidated that into a few pages because we knew we, we could get someone to where they needed to go quickly. And we didn't need to to, um, to kind of beat them over the head with the content like the, the site was doing previously. Um, well, the thing that nice thing about that is they have a, they actually ha have since launched a few other locations. So we put them on a WordPress multi-site platform. It allows that allows you to manage multiple you know websites or web assets under like one parent organization or parent site, and then you can quickly launch a new one. So I, I think um, there was another they had another preschool it was like Woodland Preschool, and I think they have one more one more program now as they're trying to expand. But now they're easily they're they're able to quickly easily and without our help launch that next website it's going to have a very similar look and feel but they can change things like colors um and and images throughout the throughout them but they're not going to it's, it's going to have the same sort of like user engagement um path it's going to have the same user interface and that that way they know they've, they've kept it optimized and kept it up to date um we integrated a couple of websites or a couple of different separate integrations with their website like loom uh, and Calendly and Zoom um, for different like member support. Um, so just touching on some of those examples we we shared previously of of, of adding integrations after the fact. And then one that's a little bit, a little bit more complex. Uh, this is like a membership driven website called the National Trafficking Sheltered Alliance. Uh, so certainly brochure style and and, and uh, event style pages, but they emphasize driving membership. So we built, you know, on the WordPress platform, uh, a member portal that handles the registration, payments, uh, and access to like members only content. Um, you can see public facing, you can see the, uh, like the membership directory. And then once you join, you can see, you know, more information about those groups, uh, you can actually engage with those groups. And then they have um, membership pricing and they also have like tiered event registration and pricing. So members get a certain price for events, uh, guests get a different price for events and then different levels of membership also get different prices for those events. So this is a little bit more complex, um, but again, st still using that same methodology, using those same platforms and following those tactics we talked about. And I'll turn it back over to Joe to, to breeze through our, our, our service offerings through TechSoup. Great. Thanks, Kyle. So, yes, TechSoup has uh, website offerings. Uh, Tap Network, we're the exclusive provider for website offerings. So if you go to TechSoup's homepage or any page on TechSoup and you go on the uh, top nav, click on services, you'll see website services and digital marketing. Uh, that's us. TAP and TechSoup in, in partnership together. So we do website services and the uh, the digital marketing. So that's one way to get there. And just give you a, a quick overview. So like like we said in the beginning, um, you know, there's and and you guys have have you know provided the feedback. There's nonprofits can fall in, in, in dif into different buckets. And when you're first starting out, you might be on a Wix space, a Wix or Squarespace website. Or doing a lot of the website development yourself, 
We help support those clients. Um, we have a website services offering starting, I think it's around $500 a month up to a thousand. And that's really to provide that ongoing ticket-based retainer support. So you might be doing your website and that's kind of, you know, we'll help you out there. And then for other nonprofits who have been on the not been on a Wix, Squarespace or WordPress, and they're ready to make that big jump. Um, we have a website development product that starts at $15,000 and we could, we can meet with you and, Basically, have a quick conversation, look at your site, and generally give you an estimate on, on the phone. It might be $15,000 to relaunch your website. You may want a, a CRM. You may need a volunteer management system, donation platform integration, or marketing automation such as HubSpot. So we'll be able to quickly assess all that and then pull together a, a scope of work. But like I said, most websites started around $15,000 and... We can work from there, but again, each each client's different. But we can we can work with anyone to to really see where you are and, and hopefully support you. Anyway, that's uh that's what we have for today. We hope that was super helpful. Um, and now we'll open it up for questions. And if you could just put them in the chat, Colin, I'll be glad to uh, do our best. I'm not sure if you're able to see the questions in Q and A, but um. Carrie says, as a nonprofit supporting a vulnerable community, the challenge is being empathetic to the human seeking out care, but also having information for potential donors. They're two completely audience, so we kind of have a dual space. Just a comment. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so we we see that we see this very very frequently. Um, you typically one of the better ways one of the ways to um, to address that is kind of having like a a self-identification when you come to the website. So you say, you know, I'm a supporter or I'm someone in need type of thing, right? And we we want to keep it kind of high level, but just enough so they can identify them, them, themselves down to one of those paths. And then we'll typically have like a section of the website um, specific to those different audiences. So it could be like for donors, for supporters, for volunteers, um, or for someone who's in need. And then, um, you know, working with a, a number of different organizations, we work with like domestic abuse organizations where this is like very important where we have, you know, resources and things like that available for them, but they also want to have the ability to like, you know, if they're, you know, unfortunately in, a, in, in an active situation where they're, where domestic abuse is, is, um, is prevalent, they might need to be able to exit out of that website really quickly to, so that no one can see that, you know, that they, they showed up on that, they were on that page, they were browsing that page. So, Thinking about adding in features and functionality like that for that that meet that audience um, and that can you know I guess appeal to that audience. Um, so just breaking up that way, so it's it's you don't get, you know, you don't want to get the donor down. You don't want to take the donor down that path either. Eat down that path though, and make them you know be able to quickly you know exit the website or, or pull up a, a new page. Um, if someone was watching them, you want to give them the different information. So it comes back to that content architecture and planning out that user user flow and user experience. Mm, that's good. Dr. Joe says, other than Google ad grant, are there any other web-based grants that are available to nonprofits that you guys know of? Uh, not like kind of uniformly available. I, I know that, you know, obviously through TechSoup, we, you know, we, we provide our services at a discounted rate. Um, and I know that there are other like types of grants, like there are organizations out there that, that provide those types of grants. So that could be either through some type of corporate social responsibility grant could be through a partnership with TechSoup where they might, um, you know, provide grant funding for a certain percentage of a web project or, um, you know, different state level or, you know, local, local grants um, may, may be available for different organizations. Aretha, I, I can see that. I, I can see the QA, so I don't mind reading them off. Um, and just Perfect. Going... Perfect. Thank you. Um, so somebody asked the best way to dictate image appearance, like percentage, et cetera, for mobile. Uh, that's, that's, there's not a one size fits all answer to that um, because it depends on what you're what you're using the image for whether it's like an icon that's just supposed to be like a um, you know type of abstract thing that just shows that this is where you do something or if it's like you know a, an image that's showcasing like a featured image for like a blog post or a news article or to show impact um, it's more about the size it's it's about the size of the image and making sure it renders on different devices so if you you know if you take a picture with your cell phone and you and you use that and upload that to your website, often those pictures are going to be really big, way too big, way bigger than you would need for um, a desktop 
browser for sure and definitely for a mobile device and they're going to be really large in size so if you think about putting three or four of those on one page it's going to take longer for that page to load it's also probably not going to render correctly um so it's just you know making sure that's that's they are optimized for the different devices that also optimize for all devices um so think you know aspect ratio and size of the image if it takes longer for your page to load google's going to penalize you and push you down further in search results uh, you you might alienate someone who's trying to visit your site and they're seeing that your site's loading very slowly. And often that's because there's too many, too large files or too large pictures on there. Um, if you're using something like WordPress, there's a number of uh, different tools that are available or plugins that will call like smush the images or re reduce the image sizes for different size um, browsers or different size devices. Um, and then no other, another like Wix and Squarespace and things like that also have similar features that, that are built in, um, but I would start without those crazy size images. Um, someone else says, the I'm interested, I need to build a case for my trustees to pass a large percentage of our budget. What research is happening out there on doubling donation conversions with streamlining? Uh, again, I'll probably say this a bunch of times, but there's also not, you know, same, not a one size fits all. Uh, a lot goes into that, like, you know, who, where are you getting these donors? Where are you getting these, this audience from, you know, is it the right audience? Are they, um, you know, resonating with your messaging? Um, the website itself is, you know, full transparency is not going to be, be like the silver bullet that, that solves that problem, you know, up, updating um, the user experience, updating the user interface, putting more content specific to where their donation goes and showing the impact that they could have working uh, you know, on a marketing program or an automation program to drive someone back to your site or try to enhance or increase their donations are all going to go into um, you know, how to get more out, how to get more donations out of that. Um, we just, we, we want to also, we often try to think of that like a, as, an, a, as a single direction for why or what, why a website's being built. Um, because, you know, to someone's question earlier on, there's often multiple audiences. So yes, it might be important to drive donations out of this. Um, you're probably less likely to get a donation from your website than you are to get someone to your website who later donates because they found you uh, on the website, on the web, right? So they might come to your website and see that you have an event, come to attend the event and then buy raffle tickets or, you know, bid on a, a, an, as part of a silent auction or, you know, donate at the event. So your website was still kind of that front door, that initial piece that that got them in there, or then or that converted them, and then they later became a donor. Um, you also it also might be the the entry point for um, the the community you serve. So especially you know during COVID, but even more it's always been important, but more importantly, we saw this happen during COVID, where a number of nonprofit organizations that serve people uh, through brick and mortar locations were now not able to 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 reach to talk to their audience to engage with their audience to to serve that audience. Um, and the website was, is, was kind of like, it was like an aha moment for a lot of people, but the websites where they, where they could have been doing that all along. So we worked with, you know, boys and girls clubs and things of that nature to, to take typically offline, uh, engagement, offline, uh, materials and bring them online and create a space or a safe space for their audience to engage with them. So they could look up curriculums or they could, you know, have, have some activities they could do at home. They could engage with, you know, other, um, you know, other audiences and things like that. So th I would think of, think of your audience as more than just, just that one dimensional thing. Um, some more like best security use consider on a WordPress website when using third-party plugins. Um, same thing there. Like there's a number of different options out there. It really depends what you're doing, what you're collecting. Um, the host is going to be one of the most important decisions you make, who, who, who it's hosted with, where that, where their servers are, um, where that infrastructure is, what kind of backups, what kind of security they have in place. Uh, and then there's, there's certainly, um, you know, plugins that are available like, uh, like word, word fence or security, um, that are, that will add layers of security. And then how the sites, how the site itself is structured, built, coded up, um, is going to be important too. Um, someone asked what to consider when choosing a membership management plugin for member login or password protected purposes. Uh, it's really just, you know, what's, what's important features and functionality wise, and make sure that you're selecting a plugin or a tool that accomplishes that. And then also, again, looking to the future. So we, we, we often get requests from people who have some type of member 
or member login, but it doesn't do all the things that they now need it to do. So, you know, giving them the ability to download, save content, you know, like content, upload content, whatever it might be. So be sure that like where, where you are now is also, you're also planning for where you'd like to, to eventually go, but, you know, kind of balance that between not biting off more than you can chew. So don't, you know, where it's not going to be overkill. Um, Somebody asked, are there any metrics on linking to uh, websites of sponsors or donors from a nonprofit website, like number of clicks? Do people respond positively, negatively? I don't I don't have that information um, offhand. I know I'm sure there are, you know, benchmark studies, case case studies and things of that nature for that. Again, it's probably going to be um, like sort of like industry specific, even within the nonprofit space. Best practice for bilingual website. Um certainly to localize them as much as possible. So, you know, having content that is written, um, you know, in the really with the same sort of tone uh, and, and style that would be in that localized audience. So that obviously, you know, I'll just pick Spanish, like Spanish in the United States is different than Spanish in Mexico, than spoken Spanish in Mexico, which is different than spoken Spanish in Spain. Um, so, you know, localizing that for those different audiences. Uh, certain platforms, certainly WordPress, things like HubSpot will allow you to better do that. And it will differentiate like what, what version of the site or which, which language shows uh, in those different audiences or for those different browsers. There's also some great, um, you know, plugins, tools, things like that, that will translate sites for you as well. So um, if it's, you know, not, if you're not going to translate every word, it will do uh, sort of like a machine translation. Uh, one thing that's important to note with that is being sure that you're using text wherever you can and not putting text on an image and uploading that that image with the text on it on your website because if that image has you know english text over top of it and it's supposed to be translated to spanish you're going to miss you know part of that audience um are there any in website tools to help optimize images i can there's certainly some for like wordpress there's like smush it there's one called Imagify, I think there's EWW um, image optimizer. A lot of the caching plugins will have image optimizers in there as well. Um, somebody asked, is there any way to tell if a plugin is still being used? We have many of them installed in our WordPress site and it's hard to tell if they're currently being used on the back end. We would like to remove the inactive ones to speed up our site. There's a few different tools that will, will allow you to do this. Um, and certainly uh, just so one of the better ways to do to, to do something like that would be to create like a, um, a development version or a staging version and then testing uh, the different the different plugins that you you know suspect that are not being used and looking for that feature or functionality to, to that's that's part of that because even those plugins aren't going to catch aren't going to find every uh, sort of like remnant of something that's being used across that site. Um, someone asked how often should I update websites? There's no, there's no right answer to that. It's keeping Google, you know, the search engines, you know, you're seeing this more with AI as well. Um, they're going to want you to keep it, keep it updated as, as frequently as possible. Um, but it's gotta be relevant. So not just, just not just going on every day and adding like a few words or something like that, or a new image, but making sure it's kind of kept up to date. So you know, especially if you're doing things like seasonal, um, like seasonal promotions or things like that, you don't want someone to get there, come there in June, they still have something up about, you know, Thanksgiving from last year, uh, or like, you know, fall photos or things like that up there. So keeping that stuff up to date. And then as far as thinking through like the actual core and structural updates and design updates, uh, that's subjective to the organization as it's as it's needed. But, you know, kind of always keeping in mind that the website, the platform should be patched and up to date, so that you're not, you know, vulnerable to security threats and then being sure that you're following best practices, whether that's like ADA or WCAG guidelines for accessibility, or if it's just general best practices um, for building websites to, to kind of keep you at the forefront. So, um, you know, it looks like something's fresh and someone's like, oh, there's something's changed since last time I come here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in learning more. And I think we got we got about one minute left, so I'll just wrap it up. I just want to say thank you all for joining and for the really engaging um, questions. Uh, great kind of depth uh, from you all today. Uh, as Aretha said, we will be sharing this um, the slide deck and the recording. You'll probably see this later today or tomorrow. Um, and within that, you'll see um, there's an option to get like a, a consultation from us or from our team. If you just click that uh, that. 
button that'll be on that second to last slide for web services that'll come right to us and then you can just kind of tell us like some of the the struggles or the concerns or the uh, the questions you might have and we're happy to schedule a call with you all thanks everybody <laughs>